All right, uh, welcome to the KCP community meeting, July 6th, 2021. Uh, we skipped last week, so there's a bit more this week to, to go over. There's been some progress in PRs. Um, GitHub changed the way that they display a link to a PR. It's weird, I hate it. Uh, they write out the whole thing. Unrelated, um, uh, some CI improvements, finding linked errors, running more tests, uh, basically improving CI, finding things, and then fixing the things that CI fix, uh, uh, identifies. Um, uh, David sent a PR this morning that is really nice because it basically runs the demo and makes sure that the demo succeeds and uh, produces the correct output. Uh, I think it's, it's infinity times better than the previous end-to-end -end tests we had. Uh, because we did not have end-to-end -end tests before. Uh, and I look forward to improving upon the end-to-end -end test story even more um, yeah. as we as we sort of go through this and grow up and add scenarios that we want to cover. Um, David, do you want to talk about uh, uh, that anymore, or is that sort of a, a good overview? No, I think it's okay. I think you're, you're completely right that finally it would not be a replacement for end-to-end -end tests, uh, and it's not sufficient, and it's... A, as you, as you, as you uh, not, um, told it in, in the PR, it's a bit bashy as well, <laughs> a yeah. bit too much. And uh, yeah, but, but at least it, it seems quite interesting to, you know, ensure that, that also the, the demos that we use to showcase stuff in, you know, uh, conferences or also for people to run interactively are not broken by the, by any change. So that's, to me, that's more something that is, Complementary to uh, what should be into future end to end to end tests. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. the 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 demos we have now are currently the only end to end experience we have, <laughs> and so we should run them in CI. Uh, but definitely, um, non bash tests will be great in the future as well. Uh, sure. And I sent a PR last week that David had some feedback on it about using uh, a multi-error package to describe. So when you do see our negotiation, there can be mm. dozens, hundreds, millions, potentially, of things wrong. And we shouldn't just fail at the first one and say, like, the worst thing is when uh, a million things are wrong, and it tells you, here's the first thing I found wrong, and then you fix it, and then it says, here's another thing you found wrong, and then another <laughs> thing, and then another thing. You'd rather just see, like, a thousand errors at once and then fix each one. So. Um, and that is the case already. We already have that using the Kubernetes aggregate error type. I forget exactly what it's called. Um, but yeah, yes. in the feedback for that PR, uh, I thought we should use a different error package. I think there's still room for improvement on this. I think, your, David, your feedback is correct. We should come up with something even better. Um, but I thought this was at least a, a, yeah. a slight improvement over that um, that we can that we can figure out. Unfortunately, there's a lot of like of fighting with Go's type system and Go's standard built-in support for stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wish that the language just had this this kind of thing. I mean, I wish the language had a lot of things, but um, uh, mm. this is at least I think better than we had before. But we'll keep we'll keep working on that. There's also I forget I forgot to mention the uh, the PR to rebalance across clusters as clusters add and, and delete and move and change uh, is also still open. Uh, I should. Uh, I should make sure that is all good after all the CI improvements that I haven't broken something in there. But um, that's still good to go. I don't know if uh, in the last two weeks, we've also, also talked to a lot of folks uh, both on Slack and, and in meetings about uh, improvements for multi-cluster networking and how this all works with um, Submariner and, and in general networking across clusters. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody has any updates. I would guess Joaquim is probably the person most likely to have an update there. Uh, if not, that is fine, but I'm just curious. Uh, well, honestly, about multi-cluster, I don't really have an update. Uh, we are working on defining how to proper, you know, well, propagate the services, et cetera, but uh, not a big update. And about the global, um, a global load balancer. Uh, I've been working with it, and, and basically, I hit some of those questions that you have. 
uh, here for discussion, which is in what cases should, should controllers run against KCP versus physical clusters? For example, that's one, mm -hmm. one big question that we need to actually, I don't know, give some examples or, or better understand, because I guess there are some performance issues that things will not scale depending on how we create that. And also, um, well, about that topic that that is for me. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. I think that's a, that's a good uh, segue into the discussion that I that I wanted to talk about. So over the last week or so, I've been sort of trying to write down in preparation for the next thing, the live stream walkthrough of KCP tomorrow at eleven a.m. to try to sort of refine and uh, update the elevator pitch of what KCP is and how it works and, and everything to the bare minimum. And as part of that, um, uh, I wanted to try to come up with a good short description of when a controller should run against KCP mm. versus a bunch of them running against physical clusters and sort of, you know, uh, CRD negotiation is fantastic and, and honestly bordering magic, uh, but it is only necessary when we expect those CRDs coming into KCP to go down to physical clusters and, po and possibly be incompatible and possibly uh, uh, need negotiation in the first place. If we run everything against KCP, that would mm. fix, that would sidestep the CRD negotiation issue and incompatible controller behavior. But then, you know, we don't remove problems, we just move the problem over here mm. to KCP where now we have, you know, performance bottlenecks and resiliency, uh, a single point of failure issues, and you know any number of other things. I don't think that there is an answer. I don't think we're going to get to an answer of you should always run against KCP or you should always run against physical clusters. But I think the thing I've been thinking of is concisely and correctly describing if you are this kind of thing, prefer running against the KCP. And if you are this kind of thing, prefer running against the physical cluster mm. and possibly both. Possibly you will need to run some components in physical clusters and some components against KCP. I was talking to Clayton a bit earlier today um, and he had the good insight of, I, I had been thinking like Knative for instance, um, could just run against the KCP in my thinking uh, and not you know create pods and send those down to the clusters and the clusters just regular vanilla Kubernetes clusters without CRDs or controllers or anything um, could run those pods. And his counterpoint was that the uh, Knative autoscaler components should run in the clusters because they're going to be very chatty and close to that local API server and the local metrics to decide when to autoscale and how to autoscale. Um, but then the uh, Knative service to pod translation controller could run in KCP. Uh, then you end up having a single point of failure in KCP uh, if if the cluster is disconnected from the KCP, you wouldn't be able to delete or update or create mm. services. You wouldn't be able to modify them, but the data should still flow through. Um, in short, I think the answer is it's complicated. I think we don't, I think we all know that it's going to be complicated, but I'd like to have a better idea of identifying behaviors of controllers and types of uh, types of controllers to say you should prefer to run against the KCP and you should prefer to run against physical clusters mm. and maybe split your controller into, you know, if your controller does eight things, if it has eight reconcile loops, these three should be over here and these five should be over here. Um, and so that definitely ties into the networking stuff that we're talking about, about uh, giving KCP a service or a load balancer um, or things like services and load balancers, should those end up getting passed down to the clusters or should they be reconciled against the KCP? I don't know. Uh, uh, but we will find out, I think, as we keep going. David, does that, did, uh, I don't think you and I have talked much about this. Do you have yeah. ideas or? Yeah, I mainly have the, the feeling as well uh, that, that the you know, border between those two layers is somehow you know, fuzzy or moving according to uh, requirements and, and the, the, mainly the topology and the type of things that uh, have to run on both layers. So that's also mainly my feeling, but I still find quite interesting that we more clearly de would define the type of constraints or the type of structures that would <clears throat> mostly point, you know, to 
KCP layer or physical cluster layer. So uh, I mean, having some sort of advices for for users is is quite important to me. Maybe just one point I was thinking about is uh, uh, regarding CRD negotiation or more generally, you know, the the the, the um, consistency checking of APIs. It seems that it it spans. Um, wider than than only physical clusters uh, if i'm not mistaken um there is the able i mean we would have the i mean the fact that an api comes from a physical cluster or from a, a, a another logical cluster is just a, you know um implementation details so i assume that it's not something that we've um you know envisioned uh, or implemented concretely in our current use cases but if I'm not mistaken, the, the idea also of logical clusters is to have, you know, very, quite small logical clusters with dedicated workloads inside, and then having them discussing or you know uh, interacting um, between several logical clusters. And in such cases, I assume that we would have some use cases where, where we would import APIs from several logical clusters that somehow somehow interact uh, together. So maybe that's also an, another area where CRD, you know, negotiation or let's say more, you know, API consistency, uh, you know, uh, work uh, yeah. would be required. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. The because we have separated uh, physical clusters and logical clusters, um, we we've done this on purpose so that. Uh, People logically talking about uh, domains or, or mm. you know, small yeah. sets of, of uh, cluster is the only word we have for this. Uh, logical <laughs> things uh, can be separated from physically where it runs, physically mm. how it runs. Um, we will have different logical clusters having to negotiate among themselves these yeah, because... uh, these types and and behaviors, right? Because from the point of view of inside a logical cluster, uh, another an, an external logical cluster or an external physical cluster is just a cluster. You know, it's just right. uh, an right. endpoint uh, uh, from a cube config. Right, and so, at, at that layer, they don't even yeah. they don't even make a distinction. I think they don't care whether it's a physical or logical cluster. They're talking yeah, about yes. types, exactly. a set of types that might be consistent or inconsistent with the current set of yeah. types. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. I, that's why I think also that you you know we use CRD negotiation because it's quite a historical way to to name it. But but finally, as as Clayton said once, uh, it's not much more um, about CRDs than about APIs. I mean, API yeah. the uh, consistency domain. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but but yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> I mean, yeah. change the, the I, flow of the of the discussion. No, I think I, I, it's it's worth pointing out because right, it's not just saying like, if we can tell people physical clusters or KCP, then we will have obviated the need for CRD negotiation. We'll still have the CRD negotiation problem, which is good because we still we have a solution for it. But uh, I would like <laughs> to not sure. have to involve it as much, but. We'll still have to have it. I think the the thing, the reason that I got into this into this line of thinking is mm -hmm. CRD negotiation is absolutely helpful when the type changes in a in an incompatible yeah. way. When 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 the you know message being passed between two things changes, mm -hmm. but when a controller changes its sure. logic, yeah. it, there, it's all out the window, and there's no way to describe it. Right? Like there's there's fundamentally no way to tell whether two controllers will have the same behavior for whatever that means with each other. Um, the case that I had been using in my head as the, the test case for it was uh, controller version one sets some field to false if it's unset, and controller version two of the same for the same type unsets it if it's false. Yeah. And so if these two controllers are running against the same type, they're going to battle each other and continually yeah. set and unset this field forever. Um, and the type that has nothing to do with CRD type negotiation. The the field is the same, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's no way to detect it without. There's a way to detect that this field is going back and forth, and to raise yeah. some, you know, raise your hand and say, "Hey, something's happening, operator." But there's no way to de to detect it and stop it automatically. Um, and at 
scale and assuming this behavior across thousands of fields for thousands of types across thousands of clusters, this could be really, really bad. Uh, but there's no way to stop it. Um, mm -hmm. The way to stop it would be to prefer to run things higher, higher, higher up the tree so that there are fewer hmm. possibilities for things to conflict in this hmm. way. But that that brings in its own set of things like performance, like resiliency, like things like that. So yeah, so such such a use case is main is typically um, something that we can describe in the constraints about you know putting your um, controllers on the physical layer or the KCP layer. That it, when you have them on the physical layer, then you have the risk of doing some you know incompatible. Uh, process on this shared APIs that will conflict when brought up to the KCP level. But then it's it's useful for for other stuff. So mainly, yes, I think you know trying to categorize the various use cases is important because such such an um, an action that you're just describing that would lead to a problem probably would only be required in some dedicated use cases that we could precisely uh, assign yeah. to to the KCP layer. And that, so that that issue is not technically limited to KCP. You can already run two controllers yeah. that fight each yes. other uh, inside a single cluster. There's nothing stopping you from from having mm -hmm. two battling robots. But the the impact of that behavior is much lower. It's, it's isolated to that cluster. Mm -hmm. And you could probably yeah. more easily tell that it's happening and stop one of them, as opposed mm -hmm. to it being, you know, one of my 100 clusters keeps setting this field, and another one of my 100 clusters keeps unsetting it. Mm -hmm. Like, what do I, how do I stop that? Um, there also tends to be one version of one controller for one type. Like, in general, nothing stops you from having two controllers over the same type, but in practice, yeah. people create a type and then people create a controller for that type. Yeah. Um, so it's really the version skew on the same controller code base on the same type mm -hmm. that we're worrying, worrying about. Um, I don't know uh, if there's anything we can do to stop it, but we should at least, and, and Clayton's idea was to like, we should have something that detects a back and forth, you know, yeah. robots fighting scenario. And that is useful. Even in a single cluster, that is that is a useful like controller you could write that just says, "I watch all types and see if a type keeps going back and forth." Or you know, sorry, I watch all resources of all types and I keep I try to detect whether a field is being set and unset over and over and over. Um, that might be yeah. an the example is, of yeah. Go ahead. I mean, so the problem is that then you can have use cases a bit more complex where, you know. <laughs> That change, but a higher number of fields change. Change. I mean, it's this case is very a very simple one, but you can have, you know, uh, more complex interactions between fields, right? Uh, of of a single resource, uh, driven right. by several controllers, there, uh, which would be much more hard, much harder to detect, I assume. Yeah, yeah. It uh, uh, it doesn't have to be. A to B to A, it can be A to B to C to A, or uh, A to B to B, or A to B to C to B to A. Like, how? Uh, uh, in general, how do you detect something is weird with your updates? Uh, mm. But that is at least something we can probably, if we build that, if we build a weird update cycle detector, that is something that is unrelated to KCP useful. Like. You, you could run this inside your cluster and just detect something is weird, uh, maybe just by volume of updates. Like, this object keeps getting updated. Are you sure you want to keep making updates to it? That's odd. Um, and maybe a first step uh, could be uh, detect all the um, controllers that uh, watch a given resource. I mean, detect resource, yeah. uh, well, uh, detect APIs of exactly the same version that are uh, managed by several controllers. Uh, and then at least you, you would be notified of that, even if it doesn't stop it. But uh, I mean, being able to, uh, on a quite very big deployment, where you have thousands of, of physical clusters connected to a KCP, having a sort of you know topology, a list or you know graph of, of list of things that are controlled by several of APIs that are controlled by several controllers, 
might already maybe help. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it would be relatively easy to detect, especially if the owner references are yeah. set. Like you can just scan everything and say, hey, this, this object seems to say it has two controllers. Are you sure? Yeah. This is weird. Uh, not, not necessarily impossible, but certainly something that raises suspicions. Um, anyway, that's that's sort of the uh, thing I had been thinking of. I need to come up with more concrete examples of types of operators that should run against KCP and types of operators that should run against uh, physical clusters, and it probably more even finer grained types of operations that you would want to happen at KCP and types of operations you would want to have. Like the case, the Knative autoscaler operation should happen in physical clusters, but the Knative service to pod translation controller should happen, could prefer to happen at the KCP level. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, does anybody else have, um, Questions or thoughts on on that topic? That's been sort of the the thing burrowing through my brain over the last few days. Um, I, I think I there's also. To, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, but I I just wanted to ask if you have some um, notes or documentation on why you went with deployment lives. You know the deployment controller that creates uh, several lifts instead of actually, for example, creating the the actual deployment object directly into a cluster. It's because you want to actually represent those deployments or? So uh, I wouldn't say, I, first of all, I don't have like notes or a, or a, a, a rationale document for it, uh, mainly because I don't have much of a rationale for it. Um, the 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 way that it is written is not you know written in stone. If if we decide we want to be able to create those things directly in the logical clusters, we would we would still create them in the logical clusters and then have them synced to the physical clusters. We wouldn't reach out to the physical clusters and create them, um, but we could uh, uh, do smarter things by creating them in logical clusters uh, instead of all in the same logical cluster as the original um, uh, deployment came in. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's written in stone, so I, I don't want to like uh, I lost my train of thought. I think don't don't assume this is the right way because don't assume it will always be the way. Uh, we will probably we should remain open to change and should change it if we feel like it. Okay. Uh, yeah I think there, it makes sense as we need some way to to actually determine where those objects will be created. So by doing that, you're letting KCP actually apply the logic to create those leaf objects into the other uh, physical or, or logical clusters. But yeah, I just, you know. I think even for, for now, while we are playing with it and trying to, to see it, that's also the easiest way to see what's happening rather than, set, you know, like if I create a deployment in, in cluster uh, in KCP, and I want to see what it created. Uh, right now, I can just do like kube cuddled list deployments or you know get deployments, and it'll show me all of them in one place, as opposed to having to like search across all the logical clusters it might be assigned to. Um, that's not a reason why it should be that way forever, but that's certainly convenient while we while we yeah, and maybe I'd add also that at the beginning. Uh, thinking of the demo and the various, um, you know, use cases, demo use cases, that was quite interesting to um, distinguish between, um, let's say, transparent uh, syncing, which the syncer does, you know, whatever be the the, the type of object, and then uh, the, the the controllers dedicated to a given object, typically the deployment uh, splitter, which you know. Uh, changes the object that you have in KCP to derive some sub objects for for physical clusters. So this is, it's I mean semantically two two distinct things, but obviously uh, in the future I think we already had discussed that also with Clayton that uh, the sinker could be some uh, somehow intelligent or you know um, uh, have some sort of uh, um, 
hooks that you would be able to hook into to change, uh, do some transformations when syncing. That means that what we currently do in, in, in really two distinct steps, you know, syncing and splitting could in fact be done during the syncing, mm -hmm. um, especially if the sinker lives, in the case the sinker lives in the physical cluster, uh, so the pool mode, uh, in which case, you know, the physical cluster would just watch for objects in, in KCP and then directly with some logic that is hooked into the sinker uh, and possibly, you know, specific logic that people could, could add, then um, it would directly create the right objects at the right place in the, in the physical cluster. So, I mean, it's a completely open uh, area, but obviously yeah. uh, as a start, it was much easier to completely distinguish the, the, the two aspects of syncing generic syncing on one side and specific actions like splitting on the other side yeah so so an alternative way that's that splitting and syncing could work if it was one thing was a user gives a deployment of 15 replicas and somehow big question mark the three physical clusters attached they have sinkers that search for uh, unsynced things or you know uh, unsplit deployments and they say oh a, de a new deployment has arrived i will take five of its replicas and create five replicas locally and somehow update the status on that single deployment object that i'm watching um that's certainly possible that might be what this all looks like in you know six months i i, I don't know but for now it's it's you you could also have a two-phase thing that is just done with annotations or a, a, yeah, a, yeah, you know, exactly. splitting doesn't mean creating leaf deployments it means annotating the single deployment with how it should be split and yeah, exactly. you just watch that single object and do that thing or whatever it could be a single phase it could be two phases or one phase two phase um mm. uh the nice thing is that if we decide there or if we want to play with that route it wouldn't be terribly hard to do that i think we could do that with the deployment splitter instead of creating leaf deployments do it by annotating that deployment and having sinkers watch. I guess a nice thing is that uh, the leaf deployments are each labeled with a thing each sinker is watching. And so if we we would need an efficient way to communicate sinkers, here is what you should watch if we didn't have yeah. single in, you know, individual leaf objects. There's probably yeah. some way to do that, uh, but that just that's the hurdle, I think, to getting there. Um, but that might be that might be a route worth exploring for services or uh, load balances or other types. Um, and and a, a good area for investigation is like the better the the optimal way to split a thing or schedule a thing across clusters and have things watch them. Um, another thing that I think we don't that I don't personally think of enough as a tool for for syncing and splitting is so. Let's say a deployment comes into KCP with 15 replicas. There's nothing in the rules that says we have to create leaf deployment objects for those. We could create our own CRD type of, you know, a, a, a split deployment type with controllers in the, you know, the, the sinker watches for split deployments and does mm -hmm. something with them. Um, we don't, we're not, we're not required to use the same type coming into KCP as going out or coming into the splitter as going out. Um, we just need to make sure that on the other end, when it hits the physical actual cluster, the behavior is the same. It doesn't, you never have to actually create a deployment, even on the physical cluster, you could just do the regular thing with those. That's maybe not a useful tool, but a tool we haven't used yet. Uh, and I'd be curious to explore more how that works, right? Like, so for services, uh, if a service comes, comes into KCP, we could create foo service objects and pass them down to the to the cluster and a foo service object is reconciled some way uh to do something um yeah and 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 even uh you would be able to you know have variants of the of of this logic to create virtual services if you want to switch to istio, istio or anything else i mean yeah it's completely open the, yes. the way we translate the objects that initially live on the KCP layer. Yes, I was playing with that exactly. I mean, getting a basic ingress and then creating into the um, physical clusters. Yeah, I think and into the physical clusters uh, is the objects themselves just to, you know, to create the 
well, to configure the, the ingress gateway mm. in each one of those clusters. But I, I was curious about this uh, deployment leaf, how to split those, if I, I need to talk directly to the uh, physical clusters or not, how to get the, the actual status from those objects back into the KCP um, object. You know, if, if we could extend the sync, um, the sinker, and you know, all of that. Uh, that was amazing. Yeah. So the the uh, the sinker should be responsible should should be the go between between KCP and the physical cluster. The KCP should never talk to the physical cluster API or vice versa. The right the the sinker pulls specs from KCP and potentially modifies them. Right now, it doesn't do any modification, but potentially modifies them in some way, either setting fields, unsetting fields, adding fields, removing fields, changing the type, doing literally anything is possible, uh, and then creates it in a local uh, physical API server, uh, mm -hmm. and then watches that API server object that it created, or any of the hundreds of objects it created. Maybe it creates bunches of things, and then uh, summarizes that status and passes that back up to KCP. Um, but there is a lot of unexplored possibility for how Syncr does that. Right now, it's very, very simple. It, it, it directly passes objects to the API server one-to-one uh, -one without modification. And I think there's a, a fertile area of development for what kinds of modifications can we make in the meantime? What kinds of, you know, can we take a deployment and create five other CRD types uh, from those deployments? Um, who knows? Uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely curious to see where your investigation goes, and because uh, I think you are you are attacking a problem more complex than deployments, and you are uh, probably going to hit those those uh, need those tools before deployments do. Um, so yeah, let us let us know if we can help in any way. I will do. Thank you. Um. Yeah, that's that's kind of all I had. That discussion and uh, updates on progress in PRs. Um, I have slides for the live stream walkthrough tomorrow. If people want to see them, I can share them publicly in the Slack um, before then. And and if not, you can come see them tomorrow at eleven a.m. or any. It's recorded, so you can see it anytime. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Does anybody else have anything else uh, burrowing holes in their head that they'd like to talk about? Well, there was, sorry. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> there please. was this, yeah, this other topic about uh, moving the controllers to K-native libraries. I don't know if. Yeah, uh, uh, that's it. thank you for bringing that up. I, I really, didn't like, still don't like writing controllers with the way that we do because there's a lot of boilerplate and a lot of copy and paste and stuff. And Knative has frameworks that make that a bit easier. Unfortunately, those frameworks depend on stuff in Kubernetes later than 118. And because we pin to our fork of Kubernetes at one from it's a fork from 118, it was a dependency hell to get it all together, working together. So I spent about a day trying to get it to work and failed catastrophically and went back to writing controllers the regular way like a caveman. But um, uh, David, uh, in his CRD negotiation stuff, uh, had some good like idioms and, and, and uh, uh, patterns that we can follow that I think I'd like to extend to some of the splitting stuff I'm working on. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Knative, uh, using Knative stuff uh, will be a dead end until we either update what update our fork to be on a later Kubernetes, or in the long, long term, not have a fork at all. Uh, but for now, both of those are not real high priorities. But should look into using Kube Builder. I think maybe um, I think that would potentially be useful. But basically, there's just writing controllers is just generating a ton of code and uh, it's awful, uh, but it's the best thing we have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And Knative, to, to, uh, to be clear, Knative's solution is just generating different massive amounts of code. So it's not like they've <laughs> solved the code gen problem, they've just 
generated more of it more aggressively. Um, um, but yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That was a, a few weeks ago. I was looking into that and turned out not to be fruitful, sadly. Um, all right. Maybe, if, yeah, yeah, Dave. yeah, maybe uh, I would raise um, the question. I think uh, you, Akim, you, you asked me uh, some time ago uh, about the, and you mentioned also in the KCP prototype channel about, you know, how to manage the Go client. You want to choose uh, to work in objects that you create in KCP because uh, that you create in KCP, but whose API in fact came from a physical cluster. Because yes. now we're importing, if it, stop me if I don't uh, summarize that correctly, but it seems to me what I understood is that now we import um, APIs from physical clusters as CRDs. And so then when you have, um, when you want to interact with those in KCP and you wouldn't like to use the dynamic client, then you finally try to use the client Go, but then you might have versioning problems with what is currently existing uh, in KCP according to the version of Kubernetes it was imported from. What was it your your problem? Yeah, it was that one. I mean, I just uh, wanted to create a controller for for ingress, for example. In this case, the client Go that that we have in KCP, the fork uh, only supports. I think it's ingress beta. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, or I've, I don't remember exactly, but I wanted the latest version, and it's not not available. And when I try to import those types um, from client Go, of course, there is a replacement in Go mod. Um, just disclaimer, uh, as, as you can see, I, I'm not, not an expert in, in the, the Kubernetes uh, libraries or anything. So mm -hmm. I'm a little bit lost with that. But I'm having, um, I'm having problems uh, getting those definitions from the client Go from the latest version into uh, controller that uses KCP objects. Though. Yeah, and uh, after thinking about it, uh, I didn't know really how what to what to answer, or I mean, was not able to give a, a definite answer. But it seems that it it raises a, a wider question um, about how do we, you know, we have API imports. Uh, in some cases, we can uh, even calculate the LCD uh, for some APIs if you have several physical clusters. But then, um, what do we have on the client side to access those APIs? I mean, how do we relate that to, to client side you know, facilities? Because I assume that the plan is not to use dynamic client uh, each time you, you point to KCP. So, I mean, I don't have a clear view on this, but it seems to me that it raises a, a wider uh, question and something probably we, we should put some thought in. Does it make sense? Totally. Uh, at least having a small, you know, um, some guidelines or, or an example mm -hmm. um, um, that covers this use case uh, would be amazing because uh, I'm, I'm a little bit lost. I'm trying now with, with the dynamic client and I'm learning how to use and everything but you know it will help so I mean maybe as, as a as a first step the controller that you want to to build could be built as a distinct project I mean because you 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 can run for example the deployment splitter can be run uh, out process completely out process from KCP you just have to point to the right cube config so, I mean, uh, short term, at least for you not to be blocked, it would be possible for you just to, to have your controller as, as a distinct Go uh, project. Okay, yeah, yeah, but then you, you, you required using some functions that are only uh, in the KCP. Uh, that's that's the issue and getting okay. the clusters you know listing the clusters or any information i need uh it's only yeah. on there yeah <laughs> yeah so you, you need to have the access to the api that is mainly inside the kcp or perhaps or perhaps i 
Well, yes, I, I need it. Yeah, I, I, I need it. I, I was thinking on annotating or creating those leaves with, but I need to annotate them with some name that's a cluster name, no? So. Mm. Yeah, I understand. So I think I think one way, and we've talked about this in other contexts. One way to solve this is to re re atomize the repos and have a KCP repo that is uh, just KCP with no cluster controller, with no deployment splitter, with no nothing else in it, and have a cluster controller and type repo that you can depend on. That's that's not based on that's not uh, sort of tainted with the fork. Of Kubernetes that we use and a deployment splitter that depends on the cluster controller because it needs the cluster type but isn't otherwise dependent on the the fork. Um, that is a bit of a daunting accounting task, just like mechanically moving things around uh, mm -hmm. is is sort of annoying. But if it means that people can write controllers against KCP, then that's what we're trying. That's what we're here for is to try to make that happen. Um, Maybe we can solve it with different Go modules inside the same repo, but that feels gross too because Go mo different Go modules inside of a repo is also gross. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I would be I, I would be interested and willing to sort of meet out, outside of this uh, community meeting and 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 hack on this and see what we can do to to fix this and unblock you. Um, uh, it's definitely supposed to be true that KCP doesn't require certain types of anything, right? Like KCP is just a conduit for storing random objects and types and giving them back to you. Um, so it shouldn't require you to have specific definitions of things or, or pin to this old fork. Uh, but because of the way we have laid out the repo, it, it does. Um, and that's problematic. So. Uh, short term, I'm willing to to offline help you with this and, and try to get you unstuck. And if there's no way to get it unstuck without breaking apart the repos, that's something that's on the table too. I think, um, David, does that sound? I I, I want to do it with a plan. I want to make sure that we have like API resource negotiation in the right place because that is my, mainly a cluster related thing and not a KCP related thing. Um, yeah. Well, API, is it a yeah. API consistency, well, API negotiation might be, I don't know if it's only a cluster thing or, because I don't know in the future how we would um, consider importing APIs from other logical clusters. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It mainly depends on, on what would be the use cases uh, in this direction. Uh, if it would be but either way that, that is, yeah sorry e either way wherever that code lives shouldn't affect uh Joaquin's use case or my use case for cluster or for deployment splitting right it, it shouldn't yeah matter yeah I mean I I somehow agree with you about separating uh, not having KCP depend uh, strongly uh, indirectly on on the kubernetes uh, on a given version of kubernetes apis uh, that would finally, you know, that transitively uh, constrains everyone to use an, an old Kubernetes uh, version of Play and Go. Uh, that's really a problem, it seems to me. Is um, you have much more experience with our fork of Kubernetes than I do, mm -hmm. on a scale from you know an afternoon of work to six months of impossible. How hard <laughs> would it be to update our fork to a more modern? Kubernetes fork. Yeah, I, I think it may be two days of work or three, I don't know. I mean, or even even possibly less, but I know that there were, it seems to me that I saw that there, there are some areas touched around that changed a bit, but I don't think that should be, you know, terrible. Really. So I, yeah. I was mainly thinking about uh, taking that as, in, as one of the next uh, it's it's all it's like a, a, a medium term solution to the problem. It's not as sure. grandiose yeah. a solution as breaking everything apart again. Uh, and we, if we do it regularly, each each update of the fork will be easier, and we'll need to update the fork when we come to uh, you know proposing caps. We want to make sure that the the cap we propose is based on an updated fork, but.
Yeah, exactly. So I, th that's why I even, in any case, thought it should be necessary because if we want to start thinking about how to contribute back even some small pieces of the changes we did, uh, we'll have to be, you know, much <laughs> nearer the, the, the Kubernetes upstream main yeah. branch. So, uh, yeah, short term, uh, uh, I'll reach out to you and try to figure out a time to go through this and see if we can figure out how to, like what dependencies we need to pin or whatever. Um, updating the fork would be helpful and is something we need to do eventually anyway, not like a high priority, but something if, I'm glad that you think it's a couple of days and not uh, terrible. I, I have not, I don't have as much context on what is different between 118 and 122 uh, for our needs, but and long term, I think we do want to split apart things. As we contribute more yeah. of KCP upstream, KCP disappears as a thing, right? Like just yeah. becomes regular Kubernetes can be used in this way. Uh, and all of the other stuff around it should be its own repo. Cluster controller should be its own repo, um, et cetera. So yeah, uh, does that sound OK? I'm going to reach out to you immediately after this meeting and try to figure out if I can help get you unstuck. Well. Uh, my time zone for today. Uh, you know, sure, sure, sure. That... <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I won't. I won't help you. Right, I won't necessarily help okay. you right after yeah, this, yeah, but that... I will necessarily reach out to you and figure out how when to help you how. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, after yeah this. that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Uh, thank you for for taking a look and and doing this. You are the third person on earth to try this after after David and myself. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, with that, unless there are any late breaking topics, I think we can end 10 minutes early. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Uh, tune in for the live stream tomorrow and see me talk about KCP with slides. I'll also share those slides. All right. Thank see you. Everyone. See ya. Thank you. Bye.